Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This ain't a quiet church. This is a proud, proud participation church. If he don't hear you tracking, he's going to think you're not at all. Amen. Amen. So Amen. you need to talk back. You need to get Amen. It. Hallelujah. Before we get started in our word today, I want to share a story with you about a kid, about a kid who thought he was better than other people. Now, as I share the story, I just want you to remember something. You know, sometimes we have preconceived notions about who we are and who other people are. Uh, a lot of my friends are biker dudes, right? They got Harleys and tattoos, and we walk into a restaurant or something, and the people start to get a little nervous. You know what I mean? It's okay. Uh, but they're judging the book by its cover, right? And so we know it uh, better than anybody. Being from the streets, my wife and I, we know we come back to the streets to help the very people where we came from. Why? Because we know not to judge a book by its cover. We know what's going on here. We know what's going on in Southern California, Lake Tahoe. It's all over the place. So we come as servants of the Lord because we came from these streets. We dealt dope on these streets. We worked a corner on these streets. We did all kinds of stuff out here on the streets. So nothing you do is a shock to us. We don't judge anybody. But this story is about somebody who judged other people. We've got to be careful not to do that. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. you got to be careful not to judge me, neighbor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm much bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. I'm much more on the inside than I am on the outside. So this is the how it goes. Listen, it is foolish to believe that anyone is better than someone else. Sometimes our pride gets in the way so much that we don't realize what other people are really like. There are times individuals put themselves on such a high pedestal that I believe that some people may be very surprised one day when they get to heaven, who's going to be there? Come on, somebody. Jesus. The following poem is a good reminder of the foolishness of judging others. Let it serve as a reminder to us today. It says this. This guy gets to heaven and he says, I was shocked. I was confused and I was bewildered. I, as I entered heaven's door, not by the beauty of it all, nor by its lights, nor its decor. But it was the folks in heaven, come on somebody, it was the people who were in heaven who made me sputter and gasp. It was the thieves, the liars, the sinners, the alcoholics, and the trash, come on somebody. There stood a kid from my seventh grade who swiped my lunch money twice. Next to him was my old, ne old neighbor who never said anything nice. I saw an old friend named Herb who I always thought was rotting away in hell. He was sitting pretty on cloud, on cloud nine, looking incredibly well. Come on, somebody say amen to that. I nudged Jesus. I nudged him in the arm and I said, hey, what's the deal? I would love to hear your take. How, how did all these sinners get up here? God must have made a mistake. And why is everyone so quiet, I asked. So somber, can you please give me a clue? Jesus nudged me back and said, hush, child. He said, they're all in shock because no one thought they'd be seeing you. <laughs> ah, you see, that's why we can't judge anybody. Listen, right. we can't judge anybody that we come around, Amen. anyone that we hang out with, anyone that we see from the streets. Uh, people see that you're that you're a, a neighbor without a house. Come on, somebody. And they, they have a preconceived notion. Oh, you must be this. You must be that. You must be right. All these things. But us as believers, listen, we cannot judge. That's right. The Bible says, judge not, and you too shall not be judged. Amen? Amen. So our job as believers is to love people. That's Pastor Andrew in the back. And I met him down right here at the edge of the parking lot. I said, hey, Pastor, come here. Let me talk to you. And we just connected immediately. And this is why, listen, this is why we come out here. We're not judging anybody when we come. We're out here to love the people. That's right. Jesus, imagine if Jesus went around and he never healed anybody because you didn't look right. Oh, your skin's too dark. Your skin's too I can't, I can't work with you. Your skin's too dark. Yeah, right? I can't work with you. You're too, you're too slight. To, but I can't work with you either because uh, you're too white, right? <laughs> right? So imagine if Jesus was biased against uh, working with people because of their color, because of their nationality, because of where they live, because if they got, were high or they were clean and sober or whatever it was. No, 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 no. He came to everybody and he loved everybody who came into his path. Let the church say amen. amen. And as we see this, we're going to get into uh, the story from Matthew chapter 8 
Uh, it's a few different stories that work together, but we're going to start at the beginning because I want you to see the compassion and the love of Jesus. Let me, let me ask you a question. Has any of you ever had a an issue that has taken over your life? Let me. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you and tell you that my wife and I came from drug addiction. We came from homelessness. We came from tipping and dipping. We came from hiding and sliding. We came from peeping and creeping. We came from all that stuff on the streets, amen? A lot of years, man, I dealt dope for a lot of years out on the streets in San Bernardino, California, Rialto, California, all over Southern California. My wife was a drug runner for a lot of years, amen? And that's why we come back to help the very people that we came from. Now, you guys look at, might look at us and say, oh, there go those, those do-gooders, there go those do-gooders. They come down here every week and they're just trying to get people to come to their church and all that stuff. That, there, nothing could be farther from the truth. We are not trying to build a church. We are trying to build a family. Amen. A family of believers. A family who's been healed from the same things we've been healed from. A family who's been turned around from the same, same things we were involved in. Amen. Yes, yes. A family who says, listen, uh, I love you enough to come down here to be able to tell you, listen, that life path that you're on, the life choices that you make, all the decisions that you're going through, the stinking thinking that happens in our, in our heads. Amen. The Lord wants to heal that and set your feet on the solid ground of Jesus Christ. Let the church say amen. amen. And so you don't have to come here and feel like we're, we're here to judge you and we're here to do all these things. We're not here for that. We're here to tell you that you're much bigger on the inside than you are on the outside. And no matter what you're facing or experiencing in your life, God has a blessing for you. Let the church say amen. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is powerful. Listen, so we don't come down here to tell you how bad you are or how, you know, point out all your bad stuff that you've done and, and say you're not good enough for this, you're not good enough for that. Uh -uh. We don't do that. We don't do that. In fact, I heard a rapper say one time, he said his style ain't good enough uh, because the kid ain't hood enough. Something like that. It was really good when, when he was rapping. I was like, oh, that sounds like me. His style ain't good enough because the kid ain't hood enough. Amen? Amen. But watch this. This is so powerful. Because the word of God applies to everybody. The word of God applies to every situation. How many of us made decisions in our life because we were hurt by somebody else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody hurt us so bad. Somebody rejected us. Somebody treated us badly. And here's the, the crazy thing about when people treat you bad. You may not remember the words that they said to you, but you'll always remember the way they made you feel. That's right. Come on, somebody. That's say right. amen. This is powerful. This is powerful. So you've got to understand something. We're not here to remind you of that you're not good enough. We're not here to remind you that you don't qualify. We're not here to remind you that all these things about you. Listen, uh, the, world, the world spent all their time making sure you knew that every day. We're here to tell you that you are good enough, amen? Exactly. That the Bible says you can be blessed and not cursed, amen? That you can be the head and not the tail. That you can be the first and not the last. And Jesus said you are a royal a priesthood. In fact, you are the children of God. Yeah. And the church say amen. And I don't know about you, but the Bible says to me that no weapon formed against me can exactly. prosper. Exactly. That when people talk bad about me, I am blessed. Amen. That when the devil tries to put a, pan, a plan in place to destroy me, Jesus says, no, you can't even touch him. Uh, 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 what was that rapper that had a song that said, you can't touch this? What was his name? That's your hammer. That's your hammer. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, look, Jesus, uh, yeah, I wish I could do the guess. 25 years ago, I could do the guess. I remember. But look at, what the, look at what the Lord says about you. The Lord says you are blessed. The Lord says the enemy can't touch you. The Lord says I have something uh, good for you in store for your life. In fact, I shared this just a couple of weeks ago. Listen, that Jesus is the architect of your life. God already knew the plans that he had for you. Plans to bless you. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you a good hope and a good future. But does an architect do the building? Does he make the building? No, he makes the plans for the building. Yes. The builder is you. You've got to build your life according to God's plan because yeah. the enemy also has a plan for your life. That's right. Help plans us. to keep you stuck. Plans to keep you addicted. Plans to keep you out here on the street. Plans to keep you doing the hustle and the bustle of the world out here. So you've got to decide, amen, you've got to choose for yourself, will I do God's plan for my life? Yes. Or how about this? Number one, I would like to know more about God's plan for my life. Amen. Yeah, because let me just tell you, when, when the Lord shows you how good he is, when the Lord shows you, Mr. Juan, that he'll forgive your sins, yeah. that you've never done anything so bad, amen, that, that God can't forgive you. 
I had a friend tell me one time, he says, Pastor, I can't go to church. I said, why not? He says, I've done too much bad stuff. And I told her, turn around and said, that's like saying you're too dirty to take a shower. Yeah, it's yeah. the very thing that you need to get clean. Come on, somebody say amen to that. Amen. 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 And all of us, I used to think that too, man. I, said, I, I dealt dope on the streets for a lot of years. And I said, how is the Lord going to accept me? Someone like me, I've done terrible things. I've done horrible things. I've seen uh, terrible things. I've committed horrible things in my life. But let me just tell you how good God is. He yes. says, nothing you did in your life surprised me. I knew your days from before the beginning of time, your life was already planned. Your life was already before God's eyes. And he says, I know she's going to struggle here. And I know she's going to do good here. And I know she's going to have some problems here. And I know she's going to do good here. And one day in 2021, when she comes to the park to come and have dinner, there's going to be a crazy pastor with buck teeth and dirty elbows preaching the word of God saying he loves you. Yeah. Let the church say amen to that. Amen. <laughs> That's the truth. Listen, that's the truth. You think you're here by accident. We already knew you were going to be here. Come on, somebody say amen to that. Amen. And this is the beauty of it, that God says, look, I know the plans that I have for you. And if you'll ask me for forgiveness, I will lavish my love on you. I will lavish my forgiveness on you. I will lavish you with grace and mercy. I will make a plan for you to get out of the situation that you're in. But you got to do my plan and not to be stuck in your plan. Let the church say amen. Oh, this is powerful. Hallelujah. Watch this. This is Matthew chapter 8. Watch what he says here. Jesus has just given us the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is the story, is Jesus giving, giving the rules and the regulations of the kingdom of God. He talks about not committing adultery. He talks about the wise and the foolish builders. He says this, this is my favorite part of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter on it. Many are on that road. He says, but small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. I love that. Why? Because isn't it funny? You can always come to the park and find people to party with. You can always come down here to the park and everyone's getting high, everyone's getting drunk, everyone's sleeping around, everyone's doing dirt, come on somebody, everyone's doing that stuff. There's always people you can find to do that. But how hard is it to find somebody who loves the Lord to get on the right track with them? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, you don't see them very often. Unless you go to church on Sunday, and sometimes you might grab onto one. Hallelujah. In a church of a thousand, there's maybe ten in there who really love God. Come on, somebody. Amen. Well, look what God did. I want you to see something today. Look how much the Lord loves you. That he would send somebody all the way from Southern California who doesn't care about the snow, doesn't care about gambling, doesn't care about this, who came from the streets, just like you guys are in the streets, amen, who came from the streets to come back and tell you, listen, there's a better way. There's a better way. Do you guys remember when we were learning how to get high? Somebody had to teach you the right way to get high. Do you remember when we were getting drunk? Somebody had to teach you, oh, put that, put that Kessler away here, let's do the Jack Daniels. Somebody had to show you a, a better drink than the drink you were drinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, how does God do this? How does God work that he would raise up somebody from within your own ranks to come and tell you there's a better way? We don't even have to do none of that stuff anymore. Come on, somebody say amen to that. That's powerful. Watch this. So Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount, Pastor Andrew. Amen? Yeah. And as he's coming down from the hillside, he's been preaching to these people, letting them know how much he loves them, letting them know the power of God, the glory of God, and the goodness of God. And now we get to Matthew chapter 8, where it is a demonstration of the power of God. Now, let me talk to you about power. Uh, let me ask you a question. Does dynamite have power? Yes. If I want to blow something up, amen, I could take a piece of M80, which is a quarter stick of dynamite, or I could take a stick of dynamite and go blow it up. That would be power. I'd be demonstrating power with a stick of dynamite. The Bible says that when Jesus performed miracles, he used dunamis power, dynamite power. That instantly things would happen in somebody's life. Instantly things would happen. Now, now, my wife struggled with with uh, uh, asthma for a lot of years, and it was a result of her being a smoker since she was about three years. How long did you smoke? 
when you started smoking at three? 12. 12 years old, she started smoking, right? So she would smoke so, so bad, Mike, she would smoke so bad that when she would get sick and catch a bad cold, you know, normal people would quit smoking because it hurts your lungs when you got a bad cold. Not this one, she was hardcore. So she would keep smoking until she was coughing up blood and she was doing all that stuff. So she goes to the doctor and the doctor says, man, you've got some gnarly scar tissue on your lungs. She's got bad asthma now, she coughs a lot and all this stuff. The doctor says, you've got all this gnarly scar tissue on your lungs. And that's obviously from smoking dope, from smoking cigarettes, from smoking all that stuff. So the doctor says, all we can do is try to help you manage your symptoms. So my wife tells the doctor, the doctor was Middle Eastern. My wife tells the doctor, that's okay, doctor. I serve a God who's a healing God. That's right, that's right. I serve a God who's still in the miracle business. I serve a God who still operates in the miracles of life where, where when medicine ends, miracles begin. Come on, church, somebody say amen to that. So my wife schedules an appointment with her in three months. And then when she goes back to go see the same doctor, they take new x-rays of her lungs, right, so they can see the progress she's making from the medicine. And the doctor with the, the who's Middle Eastern is sitting there shaking her head, looking at the x-rays. She goes, I don't understand. Here's your old x-ray from three months ago. Here's your new x-ray from just today. I don't understand what I'm looking at. What's happening here? Now my wife says, what are you talking about? She goes, I don't understand. All the scar tissue is gone, except for this one scar right up the middle. But all the rest of it is gone. I don't understand. I don't understand. My wife tells her, that's because I serve a powerful God. I serve a God who heals people. Amen. I serve a God who's in the miracle business. I serve a God who wants you to see. Amen. He brought me here to get sick for my lungs so that you can see that the God, that I serve a God who's bigger than what you got. And so the new x-rays had showed my wife's healing. All her lungs were completely healed except for one scar. And my wife told the doctor, I know why he left that one scar. The doctors, the, the Middle Eastern doctor says, why? She's what do you think? Well, she's shaking her head like, I don't understand what's in, what I'm seeing. And my wife says, he left that scar as a reminder for me. That, that my God that I serve is a miracle working God. He can turn things around. In fact, say this out loud. My Jesus, My Jesus is a turnaround specialist. A turnaround specialist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what he does. He turns things around. He turned my wife around. He turned me around. He turned our friends around. He turned people that love, that we love around. People, amen, people who were struggling in the struggles of their life. He turned it around for them. He put their feet on the solid ground of Jesus Christ. He did miracles in their life. And he reminded them, I love you so much that I'm not going to leave you the same way I found you. Let the church say amen. Amen. Ooh, Jesus, I haven't even got to the word yet. This is powerful. Ooh. Ooh, let me just tell you. What's your name? Sarah. Sarah, come here for a second. I told you crowd participation. This is a crowd participation church. comes down from Jesus comes down from the giving the sermon on the mount hallelujah Jesus comes down and now here's what happened he talks about the power he talks about the spirit of God he talks about the kingdom of God he talks about all these things but now watch what happens how many of you know that the rule of law is that in here in Reno Nevada we have laws that are here but then we have to have police to enforce the law. Right. 
somebody say amen to that. Somebody was telling me the other day, man, the cops have been harassing me, all kinds of stuff has been going on, amen. So there's laws that we have here, and then we need the police to enforce the law. In the old days, when you had, in the old days that had Vikings, and they had kingdoms, and they had England, and all that stuff, they would have laws, but the king had to be able to enforce the laws. If he enacted a law, right, Pastor Andrew, he had to be able to enforce that law. So Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount, which is basically, he's giving the edicts of the kingdom of God. But now, how can you enforce the law if you're the king, if you don't have people to enforce it? So watch what happens here. Jesus comes down. He's been giving the Sermon on the Mount. And now the people start to come to him. And he shows his power not only to talk about the law of the kingdom of God, but now to enforce the law of the kingdom of God. Watch this. This is powerful. When Jesus came down, hallelujah, what it says here, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds were following him. Large crowds, there were thousands of people when he gave that sermon. And so the sermon is following him as he's walking down the crowd. Or the crowds are following him. And a man comes as Jesus is walking. He's got tons of people with him. A man comes and he falls down at Jesus' feet. And he says this. He says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. The man was a leper. Let's listen to this carefully. The man was a leper. And he came down and knelt before Jesus. He said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man. And he says, I am willing. Be clean. And immediately the man was cured of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go do what the law says and show yourself to the priest. And offer, offer the gift Moses commanded as the testimony to them. Now, many people gloss over this. Let me just share this real quick. When you had leprosy, in those days, leprosy was an, an incurable skin disease. It would start if somebody caught it, like uh, we have some friends that just got COVID the other day, amen? Uh, we, it would start as a speck on your hand or a spot somewhere on your body. And what would happen is you would wash it or you would put some ointment on it or whatever, just thinking not knowing what it was. But over a period of time, the leprosy would grow. Leprosy was a disease that affected your skin. But once it deteriorated your skin enough, amen, that you would lose all feeling in that part of your body. Until ultimately, your body would rot off and that piece of your body would literally fall off. Your arm, your fingers, whatever it was, your nose, your ears. So sin was an incurable disease. So just imagine this. Let me just share this with you. Just imagine the, boy, the man comes home. He's been plowing the field all day. He comes home and he notices that he's getting ready for dinner with his family at home. And he's hugging his kids and his wife. And he notices the little spot on his hand. Then after uh, he washes it, he puts ointment on it. And his wife says, oh, it's, it's nothing. So a few more days go by and the spot is getting bigger. The wife puts some more ointment on it and all this stuff, and he's hugging his kids and stuff like this. And so the spot gets bigger. And she, the wife tells her husband, she goes, babe, I'm concerned. We need to go see the priest. Remember, the priest was the doctor and the healer of their day. So he goes see the priest, and the priest tells him, okay, I want you to quarantine for 14 days. If the spot starts to go away, then you're okay. If the spot, uh, the spot starts to get bigger, we got problems. So the man goes and he quarantines at his house. He can see his wife, he can see his kids, but he can't really touch them too much and engage with them, kind of like COVID, right? So watch this now. So in two weeks, he comes back to the priest again, and the priest says, you know what? You've got leprosy. You've got the incurable skin disease. He goes, I'm going to have to declare you a leper, and you've got to go live in a leper colony. Well, the man says, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can't I go see my, let me, let me go home so I can grab my stuff, my, my clothing that I need. Let me go home so I can hug my kids. Let me go home so I can tell my wife that I love her. The priest says, no, you can't see anybody anymore. you got to go right now. They escort him to a, a leper colony. So now what happens is the kids and the wife have to come visit him at the leper colony. They've got to leave food for him and then run away so that he can come and get the food so they don't get the contagious leprosy. We see sin in our life 
as contagious leprosy. Sin creeps in, amen, and it's an incurable disease that's in our life. But watch what happens here. How long do you think that man was separated from his kids and his family? It could have been years. It could have been decades. It could have been a, 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 a long time before anyone touched that man or that man was able to touch anybody. So when he comes and he gives his life to, he comes down and he kneels before Jesus and he says, Lord, if you are willing, Lord, yeah. you can heal me. You can make me clean. That's right. Jesus reaches over his hand and he touches him. He grabs him and he says, I am willing. Yes. Be clean. And immediately he was cleansed from his leprosy. Here's the problem with us. We think we can get clean and sober on our own terms. We think we can beat homelessness on our own way. We think we can do these things our way. We refuse to come and kneel to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and say, Lord, I've been suffering with my addiction. I've been suffering with my alcoholism. I've been suffering with my sleeping around. I've been suffering with my sins. I've been suffering with all these things. And Lord, though I've tried time after time, again and again, I just can't get free from it, Lord. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Woo, Jesus, hallelujah. The question is, are you willing to come to the one who can make you clean? Woo, Sarah did. Sarah just did it with me right here. Yes. Sarah just did it with me right here. She says, I, I could just see it in her. I can read your face like an open book. You didn't understand what was going on or why you were feeling this way, but you knew you needed something. Come on, somebody. Amen. And this is what God does. God says, I'm willing to heal you. I'm willing to make you clean. I'm willing to deliver you up from your addiction. I'm willing to give you something that you've never had before. But if you want something you've never had before, you're going to have to do something you've never done before. Amen. Let the church say amen. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Lord. So what I want to show you today is this. The Lord is willing to heal you, to forgive you, to love you, to show you his grace and mercy. The Lord is willing to do help, help you do something different in your life. The question today, church, is are you willing to come to him and ask him for forgiveness? Ask him for the very healing that you need in your life. Because until you ask, he can't do nothing for you. Until you ask him to heal you from your addiction. Until you ask him to get you off the streets. Until you ask him, Lord, I need help with my life, Lord. My life is broken. My life is unmanageable. I don't know what else to do and there's nowhere else to turn. I tell people all the time, it, it would be much easier if we made God our first choice and not our last resort. Come on, somebody. Say amen. Man. Sometimes we just got to bite the bullet and say, Lord, this is too big for me. My life has become a wreck. I wrecked it. And I thought that I was doing the right thing. But Lord, I see, Lord God, that my decisions have got me into the place where I am now. And now my life is broken, Lord. I need you. I need healing in my life. I need your deliverance in my life. I need your forgiveness in my life. Lord, I need some grace and mercy. I need peace. I don't have no peace out here on these streets. Everyone's trying to do something. People are robbing. The poor are robbing from the poor. Come on, somebody. People are hurting each other out here on the streets. We see it every day out here. We know it. Amen. We know it. But yet, we don't do anything different to change our outcome. Well, I'm here to tell you today, church, if you change your outlook and put your eyes on the healer, he's the one who will change your outcome. Let the church say amen. Everybody stand up together. Hallelujah. Ooh, man, that's a word for somebody. Hallelujah.